Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. In the scripture, we see that God, through a variety of means and ways, he sets forth his revelation. And in Israel's history, one of the greatest opportunities for Israel to receive God's revelation took place at Mount Sinai. But unfortunately, the people, they were not prepared for God's revelation. See, when we go back to Exodus chapter 19, we see that God instructed Moses that he would command the people that in three days they would be ready, that they would wash their clothes, they would prepare themselves, and that they would not go near a woman, that there would be this separation, this distinction between male and female for the purpose of worshiping God at Mount Sinai and receiving the revelation of His Word. We talked about that in Exodus 19 and 20, where there was God speaking the Aser Hadibrot, the Ten Commandments. Now, what's important about this is that He spoke, the children of Israel heard, but now we're in chapter 32, and I would invite you to take out your Bible and look there, the book of Exodus and chapter 32. Now, if we were to, to summarize what took place immediately after the children of Israel and Mount Sinai heard the Ten Commandments, I would summarize that as rebelliousness. They did not prepare themselves. And therefore, because of that, they were easily moved away from the purpose of God, the will of God. And they did not receive the revelation of God as God intended. The outcome of that revelation that we talked about towards the end of Exodus 20. No, this was one of Israel's lowest points in Israel's history. What happened at Mount Sinai? Now, when we look at Exodus 32, we see a clearer picture of what took place. And the reason why I say that is we're going to see that, that in this chapter, Moses is going to do something. He is going to receive the tablets, those two tablets. And those two tablets are related to the Aserit Hadibrot, the Ten Commandments. And we're going to see, just like in Exodus 20, that people weren't prepared, so too now in Exodus 32, we get a greater commentary on why they were not prepared. What was the real problem with Israel at Mount Sinai. So with that said, take out your Bible once more and let's look at this 32nd chapter and verse 1. We read here, and the people saw. Now, what's important here is that faith comes by hearing. But what we're going to see here is that the people saw. They made decisions based upon looking rather than hearing the revelation of God. Now, remember, we see something going back to the Garden of Eden. We saw that Chava, she looked, she perceived, she saw that fruit that God said not to partake of. She saw, the scripture says, that it was good for food. From whose standpoint, whose perspective, her standpoint, 
And here in chapter 32 of Exodus, Israel, the people, are making decisions based upon what they have seen or what they perceive from their vantage point rather than hearing. Hearing is related to faith and acting based upon the instructions that God gave them through his voice. They didn't respond to hearing. They respond to what they saw. Verse 1 once more. The people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain. Now, there's many rabbinical explanations to this, and I would caution you to set them all aside. Let's just look at what we call the pshat, what's said here. And that is the connection between seeing, which is not based in faith, hearing is related to faith. They saw, meaning from their standpoint, based upon their expectations. See, we ought not have expectations. We ought to simply think according to the will of God. Set any expectations that you conjure up in your mind, set it aside. And simply listen to what God says. See, our expectations set aside. His statements receive expect the word of God to be fulfilled. But they weren't doing that. They had their own preconceived idea of how long Moses should be up there and whether he would come down in the morning or in the afternoon when all of these things were their thoughts, their expectations. So it says here, the people, they saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain. And the people they assembled unto Aaron. Now what's interesting is that the the singular is being used here. Oftentimes what we see is the term ha'am, the people. But it frequently takes a plural verb. But here we see it's singular, which is grammatically correct, but also states something that the people were unified, but not in the things of God. And this is a a phenomena that happens frequently. And that is that the vast majority of people are unified in what's not the will of God. And when the will of God manifests itself, there's a minority, a small minority, that recognizes it because they have discernment because of the word of God, what they have been told by scripture. Here, it's all based in their own understanding, their own preconceived ideas. So when the people saw that that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, the people assembled, and that is that they came together unto Aaron. And they said unto him, now it's the plural, They said unto him, rise and make for us a God. Very important. No sooner is Moses in their incorrect understanding, not recognizing the timing of God, but looking at the activity of God from their timetable. They said, Moses is delayed. Therefore, we're coming to you, Aaron, his brother, And we want for you to make for us a God. Now, that is ridiculous. Man cannot make God. God makes man. Man does not make God. Man can make idols. And that's why any deity that people profess that is not the God of Israel, then we are talking about idolatry. And it's so easy for people to turn away from that which is right. Why is that? Because they are wanting to be in charge. They are choosing Moses, excuse me, they are choosing Aaron in order to, notice what it says, Asay lanu, make for us. That's what's emphatic, 
for us a God according to our desires, according to what we want, which they will go, and it's here now plural, so Elohim can be understood singular as the God of Israel, or if we're speaking about uh, other gods, it's always in the plural, so that these other gods, that they will go before us. Now, we make the gods, we tell them what to do, and then we follow after them because they're doing what we want. That's idolatry. Because this Moses, the man who has brought us up from Egypt, from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. Now, here's the problem. He went up to Mount Sinai. And the, the, the mountain is ablaze. There is shofars. There is lightning. There is smoke. Something's going on. But they're not interested in what's going on in the heavens. They're not interested in what God's up to. Because the first opportunity that they can turn to do their will, their desires, to fulfill their objectives, they are quick to do it. And they do it in a religious way, but it's of the enemy. It is not rooted in anything that is related to true spirituality. Religion that's not based upon Scripture is falsehood. It is not, and we need to be careful, because it's very common today for people to, to bash this concept of religion. And we need to remember something. The Bible, for example, in the book of James, chapter 1, it speaks about religion. What is religion? To visit widows and orphans in their time of trouble. Now, why would we do that? Because of our faith in God. God, he has a special place for widows and orphans and the stranger. And if we are in a covenant relationship with him, we're going to display that same special commitment, that love, that affinity, that desire to help others in their times of need, especially the least of our brethren. So religion is good if it's biblically based. So I don't know why individuals feel they always have to badmouth the concept of religion. Biblical religion is good. It's rooted in expressing the love of God that we have for him, that he gave to us, that we directed to others in his name. We, just like Messiah taught, as you did to the least of the brethren you do to me. So I minister, I help those in their time of need. Why? Because of my love of God. But this is not what idolatry is about. So they say to Aaron, rise up. It's a call, a call to earthly prom being prominent. Make for us gods that we will walk, that they will go, excuse me, that they will go before us. For this Moses we do not know basically what's happened to him that has led us from the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Verse 2. And Aaron said to them, notice, first thing that Aaron says is parku. That is basically remove, take off, break down. So it, it means to disassemble. Remove the earrings of gold, which are in your ears, the ears of your women, your sons, and your daughter, and bring unto me. Now, we see a very important principle. Idolatry, the focus of idolatry is money. Gold here, it was seen as a currency. It has, as it does today, value. So Aaron is operating here as a false teacher. Now, I realize that in Orthodox Judaism, they do not blame Aaron whatsoever. Who do they blame? Orthodox Judaism 
only blames in this manner the mixed multitude, those who are not physically descendants of Jacob. They are the ones who caused this, this, this situation. But when we look here, we don't see that. It says the people. What people? All the people. They came together in unity, wanting to go into idolatry. And this lays a foundation for the wilderness. Israel continuously was drawn into idolatry and away from God. And what I want you to see is this. Idolatry always, at the very heart of it, is money. And that's why these individuals that you see on television or radio or whatever, they always come up with, I'm always amazed. You know, we, we sometimes turn on one and see, and we're amazed on the, the, the unique ways. They have all these breakthrough offerings. They have everything that you can mention a scheme to give if it's corona time sow a seed for health if it's this going on in the world sow a seed of this if it's that whatever so it's the same thing we see here the first thing out of aaron's mouth is remove your gold earrings which are in the ears of your women your sons and your daughters and bring them to me and immediately because they were getting what they want. They were willing to give. Here's the problem. Are you willing to give to what God wants? Or are you only willing to give to what you want? When you give for what you want, even if you're giving in the name of God, but the objective, the motivation is to get what you want, that is idolatry. And there are many people who will use the name Jesus who will use the Bible and all verses in order to remove you from truth and get you into idolatry. If we're not careful, see, Satan, he will allow Scripture to be perverted. He will allow the name Yeshua to be used in order to deceive you, to get you to do what he wants. And all the while, he's deceived you thinking, you're doing and acting so that you get what you want. You will not. So they removed, all the people removed their golden rings, earrings, which were in their ears, and they brought them to Aaron. Perfect obedience. Why? They're getting, they believe, what they want. And that's just human nature. I mean, we'll pay for what we want. But the question is, will we make a sacrifice, give of ourself and our resources for the will of God? That's the difference. People will be exceedingly generous if it's what they want. But if it's simply what God says, oftentimes people turn away from that. True believers, they are much more interested in God's will. We read in verse 4. And he took from their hand, and he did something. He formed it with a carrot. Now, I realize what the rabbinical commentators say on how they translate this. I understand what is written in Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 22, the words that are used there and how they're rendered. But instead of going into a big discussion on this, realize something, what it says, basically. It's the same word for forming something in the book of Genesis. When God formed various things, Aaron formed it, this uh, God, we'll talk about what it is in a moment, with a carrot. This is a tool, like a chisel, something to help sculpt something. And this is the mold that was made for the golden calf. Notice what it says, and he made it a golden or a molten calf out of gold. So he made a mold and he, he created this calf. And the, he said, these are your gods, O Israel. 
which brought you from the land of Egypt. Now imagine this. It was the Lord, yud heh through Moses, the first redeemer, that brought the people out of Egypt. They, there, they saw things at Mount Sinai. They were there witnessing the power of God. But you know what's oftentimes just so powerful for our flesh? The desires of our flesh. And they were willing to forget, ignore, deny the exodus coming out of Egypt. That, that plague, that those plagues that happened in Egypt, especially the last one, the plague of the firstborn, that brought about a great scream in the land of Egypt. They knew that only those who had kept that Passover, this festival unto the Lord, they were brought out. They witnessed all of this. And they saw victories at Yam Suf, the Red Sea. All these things God had done in bringing them to Mount Sinai. But given the opportunity in order to rebel, they do so immediately to deny the truth that they experience. So once more, it says, and he made it a molten calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel. Notice, they say, not just Aaron, the people. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. A lie. Why is that so important? Because everything that is not of God is a lie. And Aaron saw this, and he built an altar before him. And he, Aaron called and he said, a festival unto the Lord tomorrow. Now, here's something else that's so significant. He says, Chag Le'adonai. He uses that sacred name of God for what? This idolatry. And this teaches us something. Oftentimes, a false teacher will use the right name. Things based upon truth in order to mislead people. This is not the Lord who was fashioned in this molten calf. It had nothing to do with the Lord. But he's attesting and he's saying, you know, we're supposed to have a festival. So we'll have a festival of the, of the Lord, but we'll, we'll call these calf, this calf, we'll call this Hashem, verse 6. Notice what it says. And they rose up early the next day. Now, they were committed for idolatrous purposes. Why? Idolatrous purposes are the people's purpose. And when people believe they're getting what they want, they'll make all types of sacrifices. So the people rose up early the next day. And they gave. They gave burnt offerings. And they presented peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink. And then look at the end of verse 6. Now, most of the time, this is emphasized what is said here. And that is that they rose up to play and when you look at this we see that there was no separation between male and female they began to behave and idolatry often is rooted in sexual immorality and that's what took place now imagine god brought the people out of egypt he forgave their sin they had fallen into great impurity in Egypt, but nevertheless, because of who he is, the Lord God of Israel, he brought them out of the land. He sustained them supernaturally. He gave them victory, and he brought them to this great place where he wanted to change them. And we see that they disobeyed God twice. When Moses said to them back in Exodus 20, 
the Lord is not coming to slay you, but rather he's coming to give you a new experience, one where you will know his will and you won't be able to sin. What did the people do? They stood at a distance. They rejected. And now we see something that's foundational for that. And that is, he told them in Exodus 19, be ready. Don't go near a woman. And what happens? They are playing male and female with one another. There is no separation. So they rose up and they began to play. Verse 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses. He says, you go down because corrupt is your people. For your people have become corrupt, who you have brought up from the land of Egypt, meaning you're their leader. You're the one that they're called to be following in order to serve me. Verse 8. They have turned quickly from the way very important word derech the way they have turned quickly from the way which i have commanded them and they have made for themselves a molten that's a cast calf and they have bowed down to it and they have offered sacrifices to it and they have said these are your gods o israel who brought you up from the land of egypt now notice how great that event is the exodus from egypt it is reminded over and over and over in the scripture but the problem is they have set the redeemer aside they have turned quickly from the right way in order that they can make their god to be a golden molten calf now what does a golden calf require he can't speak he can't move he can impart revelation that's exactly what they wanted because they wanted to go where they wanted to go they wanted to do what they wanted to do and they wanted to hear what they had to say nothing to do with true spiritual revelation and when you give the people these were redeemed people, of course, in the physical. It teaches a spiritual truth, but it was a physical redemption. They were brought out of Egypt. They were brought out of bondage, a physical bondage that, that, that manifested their sinfulness. But God did not redeem them from their sin nature. Now, he was willing to do that at Mount Sinai, but they rejected him in Exodus 20. And they rejected him in 19 by not preparing themselves properly. And now we see the outcome of that in this chapter. So he says, look once more. These are the ones who say, these are your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and that means he is evaluating them. He has discerned them. Again, I have seen this people, and behold, I'm Keshe Orf Hu. Now, this is a stiff neck people. And stiff neck, Keshe Orf, this term refers to an inability or an unwillingness to bow it is a term that speaks of an unwillingness to humble and submit that's their tendency but you know what that's human tendency as well so he says I have seen this people behold a people of a stiff neck is he and now leave me meaning allow me, and it's not God asking for permission, but it's God giving a commandment to Moses. You know, step aside, leave, depart from me. And why? Because my anger is kindled against them. 
and I will devour them, and I will make you a Goy Gadol, a great nation. Now that Goy Gadol, great nation, is a citation, a quote from Genesis 12, and I hope you know Genesis 12, we're speaking about the Abrahamic covenant. So now, this, this promise that God gave Abraham, Yitzchak, Yitzchak and Yaakov, it's now going to be altered, presumably, where Moses is going to be the new patriarch. And notice how tempti tempting that would be. No longer would we say Avraham Avinu, but we would say Moshe Avinu. Not Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, but Moses our father. That's what God is offering Moses. But notice verse 11. Now, here again, words, biblical words are significant. And we need to be very careful and pay attention. Because it says, Vaychal Moshe et Panei Hashem Elohav. Now, the question is, most Bible says, and Moses pleaded before the Lord his God. Is that what this word means? Well, did you know that this word, in its most common uh, definition, its most frequent use, is related to the word chole, which is sick. Now, it's a term when Moses heard, and here's God really testing Moses, growing Moses, not testing Moses to sin, but showing us by giving Moses an opportunity to demonstrate truth within him. See, Moses understood he was humble. God knew that. And secondly, Moses was committed to the purpose of God, and those two things go together. Humility will manifest itself by one being committed to the things of God. Now, if we translate it in a very literal way to its most common use, it would be Moses became sick before the Lord in the presence of the Lord his God. Now, it's sick in the sense of he did not like this suggestion. And why didn't he like it? Well, because he's faithful to God. He agrees with God. He says, why, O Lord, will you be angry, your anger be kindled against your people? Notice, your people, which you have brought up from the land of Egypt. Now, God says, Moses, you've done it, but Moses recognizes. It's not me, it's God. With a great power and with a strong arm or hand. So who's doing God, you've done this, and why have you done it? Look at verse 12. Now, what's tying this together is the word lama. Lama means why. Why should the Egyptians say, speaking, it was evil, with evil, that, that they were brought out to be killed, for you to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the ground. Rather, he says, turn from your anger, your hot angle, your kindling of your anger. And then he says something. And I say the Hebrew because it's important that we understand what is being said here. So Moses, basically, God is giving Moses an opportunity to profess truth. And what Moses done, does is exactly the right thing. Now, notice that. He says, why should the Egyptians say, be able to say, it was for a wicked intent that you brought the people out, that you might kill them and remove these wicked people from the face of the earth. We don't want the enemy saying this. We don't want a bad testimony. Moses was concerned with the testimony that the people would think concerning God. He says, and I don't know how your Bible translated, but if you are really serious about the Scripture, you will look at a 
multiplicity of translations for this verse, the last part of verse 12, where it says, and the Lord, now, what it really is, and he was comforted, comforted concerning the, the ra'ah of your people. Now, these two words we need to understand. The word linachem and the word ra. In this case, it's an effeminate ra'ah. Ra'ah is oftentimes evil. But what's evil? That which is against God's will. It wasn't God's will to destroy the people in the wilderness. That was against his will. And Moses is recognizing, God, this is not what your will is. Did they deserve it? Yes, they did. But, but he says in the first part, be comforted. If your Bible says he repented, it's not the normal word for repentance, and it's wrong for it to be translated that way. It's not God never repents. Anytime it says that in your translation, it's this word. And what it speaks of is this. It speaks of God being comforted. Someone does something which comforts God so that it restores the original purpose for the people, for a given situation. That's why it's the same word that we have in the New Testament for Capernaum, Kafar Nechum. Nechum comes from this word, Nechema, or Lenachem, in the infinitive state, for comforting. And that is this, it's an act, and this word is so frequently surrounding Messiah and what he does. So comfort is what one does in order to change the situation not being according to God's will and renewing the situation so that the will of God once more can be manifested. And that's what Moses is saying. Moses is saying, God, find comfort somehow, some way. In order that what you did not want to do, destroy this people, that you won't destroy the people, and what you did want to do, bring them into the land of Israel and using them for your purpose, that it can be renewed and accomplished. That's what comfort is. It restores things back to the original purpose of God. God destroying the sinner it is the right thing to do, but it's not his will from the beginning. God says that he desires no one to perish. That's not his will. He does not preconceive anyone to be destroyed in, in the lake that burns in fire. He didn't choose that. People choose that. It's evil, but it's righteous. Now, what do I mean by that? This in English, it's confusing to us. But God destroying the unrepentant sinner is righteous. But it's not his, his original will. What was his original will? That the sinner repent. That's why he sends Messiah into this world, because God so loved the world and everyone in it. So this is a very important passage. Look again. He says, Ve that you be comforted concerning the, the act against your original will of your people, that your original will could be maintained, renewed. And then what does he say? Look at verse 13. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel. Now, the patriarchs, what are they known for? Two things, faith and promise. You need to write this down if you haven't. We haven't spoken of it recently, but I have mentioned it many times. The patriarchs, there's a connection between them and faith and promise. It was because they were interested in the promise of God. The promise of God is related to the will of God. They were interested in the promise of God, and therefore they acted faithfully, believed that God would, in fact, 
fulfill these promises. They had faith. So he says, remember. And remember is a covenantal word. Remember your covenant promises to Abraham, to Yitzchak, and to Israel. Your servants, whom you swore to them in you. Meaning what? It's found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And shall be blessed in you. So it's a term of blessing. That you swore to them in you. And you spoke to them. I will do what? I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens. And all this earth whom I have said, what I have said, I will give to your seed, and they will inherit forever. That's his purpose. And it's through the comfort. And who's the comforter ever, uh, in regard to this whole plan? Ultimately, it is Messiah. And the work of Messiah is carried out in his spirit, who is called the comforter. So God is saying here's a promise that he is going to fulfill his covenantal purpose. I will give to your seed and they shall inherit forever. Remember that term forever is a kingdom word. Verse 14. And the Lord was comforted because of Moses' proclamation that he got it right. That comforter was coming, Messiah. And he was comforted, the Lord was comforted concerning the evil which he spoke that he would do to the people. Because of comfort, he did not do it. Verse 15. And he turned and went down. Who's that? Moses. Moses turned and he went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of testimony in his hand. The, the tablets that were written on both sides. Now, this speaks about a miracle. Because there are certain letters, if you write them, on both sides, they would fall off. They have to be held. So it's impossible to write them on both sides. But God did that. It's supernatural. It speak that the commandments relate to the supernatural. It says the, the tablets written on both sides. Then it says, mise, mise. On both sides, they were written. Verse 16. And the tablets... They were the work of God. And it's emphatic. It says, Veha luchot ma'ase Hashem hema. The tablets, they were the work of the Lord. They were. And that they were makes it emphatic. And they were written in the writing of God. And they were engraved upon the tablets. Now, this word for engraving is related to the word that we talked about in, in earlier in the scripture in verse 4, where it says, And Aaron, he took from their hand and he formed it, meaning this, this molten calf, with a cheret. Now, that is, and we need to be careful because it's chet resh tet. But in verse, verse 16, it's chet resh tav. Now, they both sound like a T in English. But there's two different letters. The tet, verse 4, and the tav, verse 16. Two different letters. But if you read what Rashi says for verse 16, he says, in the scripture, we see that sometimes this word, is written with a tet, and sometimes it's written with a tav. So in both cases, we're speaking about the fact that God, he chiseled out with his finger. He engraved in this stone, and only God can write it. No one else. So we see what God intended to do, and we're going to see because the children of Israel turned to idolatry, because they ate and drank and they got up to play. This shows this is a very clear 
manifestation. It is a detailed revelation of the fact that the children of Israel rejected God. And we saw that in Exodus 19 and 20, when the people, they weren't prepared. When Moses told them, God's coming to you to give you a miraculous experience where you'll know his will and you won't be able to sin, they rejected. And that's what we see time and time, rejection. So let me close with this. Don't be a rejecter of God's revelation. Be someone who is committed to the purpose of God, the will of God. Someone who's pursuing the promises of God. And learn this simple principle. When I'm committed to the promises of God, I will be doing the work of God. And when I set aside God's covenantal promises in order to pursue the things of the world, what will happen? When I set aside the promises of God to pursue the things of this world, I won't be doing the work of God, but I will be serving self. Not serving God but serving self. And it comes down to that simple fact. So meditate, focus upon, remind yourself daily, what are the promises of God? And ask yourself, are you pursuing them? The answer is going to be life-changing. I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.